Showtime. Mmm. Boys, we're on our way. No, we're on our way. No. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. John Bishop. I'm on a tour of Ireland. Yeah, I can't believe I'm here either. I'm travelling all around this magical country, gathering stories and doing gigs in small pubs and town halls, all leading towards a sellout arena gig of 10,000 people. Hey, John. He's paid 230 euro on a hotel room to go see you. Can you believe that? Jeez. I tell you, you can come and have a bath with me after the gig. This is something about Ireland that I've never got my head around, but I love more than anywhere else. I just feel better when I arrive in Ireland. My journey began at the All Ireland Gaelic football final. How did you get a ticket? <laughs> I met the locals in Cork and got some advice on what makes the Irish laugh. Listen, man, the Irish will appreciate a bit of local. In England, having horses means you're posh. In Ireland, I know it's not the same, I know. Definitely has Irish blood. He yeah. just gets the crack like, yeah. or he yeah. just loves us. And or he, he wants people want to be Irish, personally, yeah. I think. He understands the Irish people. Tonight's going to be the best night. The people who came last night were just a warm-up for you. Tonight, I'm hitting the road again and meeting my match in Liston Varna. Well, no, she's not fussy about tea, no, because there's some tea tonight. Before stepping onto the sacred soil of Knock. The Virgin Mary said, Paddy, who was an air force? She's like that, the Virgin Mary. I've been doing this little tour around Ireland because... Cycling. What's that? You cycling? No, I wasn't cycling. I was uh, driving in a car and then coming on stage and telling people about it. <laughs> With the rest of the show, though, I'll be OK on my own. I'm on my way to Ennis, the capital town of County Clare in the west of Ireland. One of us did the matching thing. What, where, where's the place? Liston Varna, that's it. Yeah. Oh, Liston Varna. Liston, Liston, Liston Varna. Nearby Liston Varna is a small remote village that is home to Europe's largest singles festival. Each year, 40,000 people descend on this village looking for love. At the centre of this 200-year-old festival is Ireland's last traditional matchmaker, Willie Daly, and his world-famous magic book. Well, I mean, she is lovely, and I'd say I mean, she's good-looking as well, no, not close. She's not good-looking close up, no, but she's good-looking if you were a couple of, a few fields away. Willie's book is a living piece of Irish folklore. Hello. And it's been passed down through the generations collecting the names of lonely hearts, Looking for love. There could be a lot of good looking boys there all right now. Yeah, no, but if any of them want to work, they can't get married on the spot now, but close enough though. I've arranged to meet Willie in his favourite haunt, the matchmaker bar. Honestly, I didn't know what to expect because he said there's this matchmaking festival and there's a fellow there, Willie Daly, and he's got this magic book and he gets people and they all get matched up. And I thought, oh my god. Like, like people go to a village <laughs> in the middle of Ireland to get matched up. The festival itself is really great because it's surrounded by an atmosphere. It's surrounded by people that want to get married. The people who come here are from... Genuinely, tonight you'll see people of 18, 19, 22, but you'll see people of 91 and 2 as well. And they all want happiness and they want love and they just want to be loved back in return. And, and this place is an abundance of love, we say. When you walk down the street, walk up the street, everyone is kind of all loved up and <laughs> geared up. Now, a lot of it is enhanced by drink as well. No, I won't say it isn't, but it's nice. You know, but they come in, they have a few drinks and then they just want romance. <laughs> it's just a great, it's very simple as well. <laughs> You know who Willie Daly is, yeah. and you've heard of the matchmaking. Yeah. Um, I'd never heard of it before. English people don't have things like that because we've got Magaluf. So. 
Where are they coming from? Where are the people coming from? They come from America, they come from New Zealand, they come from Canada. And there is a big rush at the moment, which is quite a surprise on Irish men by American women. Irish men? Yeah, they just see them as being uh, the last kind of, uh, of the last rough characters that exist. Not rough, no, but good characters. <laughs> now, rugged, rugged, more of word ruggers. And he said a lot of women, particularly American women, are coming looking for Irish men. <laughs> They've never been here before then, have they? <laughs> and I'm not... <laughs> Look! I have, a, I have a theory as to why I like Ireland so much, and I think it's because you're very optimistic. There's an air of optimism <laughs> in Ireland, an and, and air of always thinking something good will happen. And I think that comes from the men, <laughs> the Irish men. And I'll tell you why, because if you're an Irish man, there's a very good chance you'll end up with a woman who's too good for you. <laughs> because... Because I see chicken in there. Did nothing to me. Look at this. Look at this piece. I ended up with it. Where was Willie in his magic book when I got here? Really, tell me the history of the book and, and how it actually works. Oh, it's a lucky old book. It's approximately 160 years old, approximately. Now, the book brings hope to people, it brings inspiration, and it brings uh, a, a bit of magic as well. So, how it works is, if you're, if you're a single person, you touch the book with both hands, close your eyes for seven seconds, and you think about romance, you'll be in love and married inside of six months. Now, this kind of works quite well for a lot of people. Now, if you just want love, if you're young, we'll say if you're 18, 19, 20, and you don't want to get married, but you want to, you touch the book with one hand, close your eyes again for seven seconds. <laughs> that you, it, but again, a lot of it is inspiration, I think, and yeah, yeah. maybe the bit of magic. If you put one hand on, you, you're gonna, you're gonna have love in the next six months, and if you put ha two hands on, you'll have love, and you'll have marriage in the next six months. I don't know. I said, well, Billy, I'm married. He said, yeah. But if you put two hands on and you're married, the next two weeks is going to be like your honeymoon. I said, I'm not doing that, Willie. <laughs> the last thing I want to do is to spend two weeks disappointed and arguing. I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> My matchmaking has always been kind of physical. Like, if I was getting someone for you now, we'd say, you know, OK, I'd probably, maybe very quickly, if I wanted you to fall in love very quickly with someone, I'd probably get a beautiful girl, maybe a Spanish accent, brown eyes, pure dark hair, very good to look at, just a beautiful face, and... Uh, You've just described my wife. <laughs> Did I? I swear to God, when I met her, she had dark hair, like, yeah. on skin. And I always wish, you know what, if I, if I hadn't messed with a mess, I always think, you know what, I wish I'd have met an Irish woman. If I hadn't a married man, I'd have looked for an Irish girl. And I'll tell you why. Because you've always got a chance with an Irish girl. For a few reasons. <laughs> I'm not on about, I'm not about to marry her, not just to... No, I'll tell you why. Because you can have a relationship with an Irish girl. I'll tell you why, because for a start, Irish girls are a good laugh. They like the crack, they're a good laugh. They don't mind, they don't mind, you say. I'm going for a drink with the lads. In fact, in my head, this is what's in my head. <laughs> don't shatter the illusion, listen. Don't shatter it, don't shatter it. This is what's in my head. That if you marry an Irish woman, she'll say to you, ah, oh, Jesus, you've not been out for a couple of nights. Go on. <laughs> Go see your mates and have a pint. That's what's in my head. You know what I mean? While I sit here in the house with the seven kids, <laughs> walking around barefoot, baking bread and feeding chickens out the back. How many matches have you made? Somewhere in the area of around 3,000. But it'll be over a 51 or two year period, or three you or four. What, I'm probably 54 years down it now, you know. That's a lot of love. I've never met anyone quite like Willie. And as for Liston Varner, it just seems to draw people from all over the world looking for love and romance. And there's definitely magic in the air. I've got to tell you this, because this is so beautiful. It's all about the magic and the atmosphere that gets 
created in Liston Varner over the weekend and all that stuff. And, you know, you could, you could think it was stupid. And then we, you know, just get, it all get carried away and it's just people putting magic on something that's not there. And then I got so to this old couple. So, Hazel, Brian, tell me your story because I believe that you found your match here in Liston Varner. Yes, we did. Yeah. We came here 12 years ago and met this lovely man here. And she was 80. She's 80 this year. And she was with the fella that she'd met there 12 years ago. And I said, oh, that's lovely. I said, what happened? She said, I've come over with a friend of mine to get my friend matched up. She said, because I was a widow. And I just thought that time in my life had gone. You know, I've been married for a, a while and then my husband had passed away and I've been, I've been a widow for a number of years. So I never thought that love would pass my door again. She said, then I just met this man on the night. We ended up in the same hotel and I happened to say, do you dance? And he says, oh, I was just about to ask you, what happens? I'll be dancing, we've been dancing ever since. <laughs> so, so when you met each other, just to, like, so you had that dance, just talk us through like, your first date. What happened on your first date? Oh, oh no, my daughter's <laughs> smiling at me, I can't tell you that. <laughs> Coming up, a holy visit in Knock. A light was seen at the gable wall of the parish church. The parish priest, sir? No. Can you imagine being a parish priest who someone comes in and goes, we think our lady's up the road? You know what, I can't be asked. I nearly... <laughs> Let's have a break. Uh, I don't know what you're doing, the break. I don't know if you want to go do some ploughing or... Um... <laughs> You've stopped. Now stop it. Now you're patronising me. I'm travelling through County Clare in the west of Ireland. Give me a cheer if you're from Ennis. OK, and give me a cheer if you're not. Oh, OK, i tell you what, Ennis, what a f***ing hole, isn't it? <laughs> I'm on my way to the tiny village of Knock in County Mayo, which, despite having a population of just 972, it annually hosts more than 1.5 million visitors who travel from all over the globe. 30 years ago, I was at a Christy Moore concert in Manchester when he sung a song about the miracle of the airport in Knock. That song was inspired by this man, Monsignor James Horan, who managed to convince the Irish government in the mid-80s to build an international airport here in Knock, in a bog field on top of a hill. That's transformed this area completely, because last year, three quarters of a million people travelled through that airport in the middle of nowhere. Who said miracles don't happen? From Fatima to Bethlehem, from Lourdes to Kilchamon, there's never been the miracle like the airport of Benoc. The story of this village is almost beyond belief, so I've come to meet the current parish priest, Father Richard Gibbons, to find out how it all happened. I know the bit of the history behind it, I know the idea that the priest wanted an airport because the Virgin Mary had come and said, Paddy, build us an airport. <laughs> Because she's like that, the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Father, this is a, an amazing facility, but for people who don't know what it's here for, what, what is Knock? Well, on the 21st of August, 1879, a light was seen at the gable wall of the parish church, which is just directly behind you here. Yeah. And people got curious, obviously. Uh, so they came to investigate the light. And in that light, they saw figures. And the figures they saw were Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. John the Evangelist, an altar, a lamb, a cross, and then hovering around that were angels, what they, what they chose to describe as angels. I, I mean, for people who, who are non-believers, they mm. say, well, you know, we're in very rural Ireland, mm. and these were just ignorant people who were, who were fooled by something. Yes, you could. That's the, that's the first thing that you say. In fact, that's the first thing that you can say about most of the major apparitions around the world. But what really stands out in that is the fact that you might say it was mass hallucination. They all came together and saw something together. However, the thing about it is that 
individual saw it from different parts of the village that had no communication with the other person. So they weren't on their mobile phone saying, do you see what's, you know. <laughs> so, so, yes, exactly. So they, because they, just for me to get... The geography mm. of the lay of the land then of, of the villages it was, mm. what would have been... Uh, the parish priest's house was just down below us here and a couple of individual um, houses right around the area. Did the parish priest say? No. Now, that was, that was an unusual thing. Yeah. Uh, his housekeeper saw it, and the housekeeper came back to tell him that there was something going on at the gable wall. He had just come in from, uh, like it was a bad day, it was raining, and he was up soaked to the skin, and I think he just sort of said, I have enough for today, or something like that. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't think he... He, di he didn't... He, nothing verbally was said, but I think, uh, knowing being a parish priest myself, you might just sort of say that, well, <laughs> you know. Uh, so he didn't. And he said, to his dying day, it will be his regret that he never oh, went up. To his no, dying day. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'll leave yeah. you go, I'm just knackered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine being the parish priest who someone comes in and goes, we think our lady's up the road, and you go, you know what, I can't be asked. I really, <laughs> not today. Can you get her to come back tomorrow? In a way, looking at the ordinariness of it, like the ordinary human aspect of it, maybe he wasn't meant to see it, and it wasn't meant for him, but it was meant for the ordinary people that came out at the time. Today, these ordinary people have made this place extraordinary. And they continue to gather in their thousands. With so many visitors, a new church was built that can house 10,000 worshippers. So, Father, we're in this amazing facility, the mm. Basilica. When was, this, when was this opened? Well, the Basilica itself was built in 1976 by my predecessor of about three back, uh, Monsignor James Horn. It took three years to build, mm. and he just had a vision for the place. Monsignor James Horan transformed his village and this church was his dream. In 1979, 100 years after the Virgin Mary appeared, he invited the Pope, John Paul II, to the village. When he turned up, 500,000 people were waiting. He seems like a... He's an extraordinary guy, what, what, yeah. What, yeah. What hell of a fellow. An extraordinary fellow. Now, I never met him myself or I didn't know him, but I heard about him growing up. And, of course, around here, he's legendary. His sheer character, his determination, his vision, all of that brought people together to accomplish this. And what an accomplishment it was. And you've got the statue of Monsignor James Hogan like that. Girl. I built that. The miracles didn't stop there. Having built his basilica, Monsignor Horan needed a way to share it with the world. And in the words of Noah and Kevin Costner, if you build it, they will come. Monsignor Horan, what, what exactly is going on here? What do you think is going on? We're building an airport. And I hope the Department of Transport doesn't hear about it. Now, don't tell them. Are, are you being absolutely serious about what's going on and here? We have no money. But we're hoping to get it next week or the week after. You, you, <laughs> you don't really have permission and you well, don't have money. I'm not sure whether I have permission or not, but I mean, I'm going ahead anyhow, just taking a chance. There's 900 people living in Nock. They've got an international airport. <laughs> Despite a lack of funds and planning permission, Horan International Airport finally opened on the 25th of October, 1985. He has built us an airport that will last for our time. Today, known as Ireland West Airport, it is considered by many to be the second miracle of Knock. When you walk out of Knock Airport, you go, did that just happen? <laughs> is that an apparition or is that, is that an airport? That's amazing, isn't it? I, I, I mean, I, I love the ambition of it. I love the fact that it's there and all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not saying anything to those who don't believe, but really when you're coming in and you're looking down and you're looking for the community, you're, you're looking, you're looking, I can imagine all the Americans coming over looking for the city of Knock. <laughs> the place that has got this big airport. I thought we were landing in an Asda, I've got to be honest. Joking aside, Monsignor Horan's legacy can be felt throughout this region thanks to an airport, a basilica, and a little help from the Virgin Mary. 
It is staggering to stand in here, and obviously the mosaic is, is the central point. So is there any doubt in your mind that that actually happened? I do firmly believe that, that uh, the apparition took place, simply based on the evidence of the witnesses and one of the last remaining witnesses on her deathbed, really. And she said, I know what I have seen, and I'm, I, I give this testimony knowing that I'm going to see my God. So this is the first time that I've ever visited what would be regarded as a holy site, really. Um, and I didn't really know what to expect, because often you can challenge whether organised religion is a good thing or the Catholic Church has done the right thing. And in Ireland, there's a lot of things that are being challenged that were accepted in the past, but there's no doubt about it. When you meet somebody like Father Richard Gibbons, there's a... There's a real sense of calm about him. And this place, for whatever it is, whether the apparition was real or not, it's given people a sense of somewhere to come. And it does something for those that do come. And if only for that, I'm glad that I've came. Next week, my journey takes me west, deep into the heartland of traditional Ireland, steeped in a world of magic, mystery and music. The simple thing is like that, I suppose, folk music, traditional music is, is, is the mother of all musics. And then I venture north to a land divided by history. Like, it was easier down south to do a gig, because down south, I assume everyone's on the same side. 